Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Jeff Wald about his book, The End of Jobs, The Rise of On-Demand Workers and Agile Corporations. And we discuss the pros and cons to a future where companies and employers are relying more heavily on technology. Jeff Wald, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it is a pleasure to have you. It was fun getting to know you a little bit in the pre-interview and just having a nice chat. And I'm excited to have a conversation today uh, about the changing nature of work and how disruptive technologies are really changing uh, what it looks like, uh, what the nature of organizations, the nature of jobs, the nature of professions. Um, So that'll be the focus of our conversation today. And really zooming in on your Amazon bestseller, The End of Jobs, The Rise of On-Demand Workers and Agile Corporations. Such a timely book, uh, an important topic. I'm really excited to have a conversation with you today about it. As we get started, I just wanted to share Jeff's bio with everybody. Jeff Wald is the founder of Work Market, an enterprise software platform that enables companies to manage freelancers acquired by ADP. Jeff has founded several other technology companies, including Spinback, a social sharing platform eventually purchased by Salesforce. Jeff is an active angel investor and startup advisor, as well as serving on numerous public and private boards of directors. Jeff is the author of that Amazon bestseller, The End of Jobs, and we'll be getting into that more here in just a moment. So again, welcome, Jeff. Uh, Before we really launch into the conversation, anything else about yourself that you'd like to share by way of background, personal context, anything like that? No, just how excited I am about this topic and how important I think this topic is, is uh, we as a society, let alone companies and families, think about how to plan for the future. It's super important to think about all of these issues and to debate and discuss them. Absolutely, I completely agree because whether we like it or not, uh, the future is coming and uh, disruption is, is the name of the game and messiness and complexity <laughs> um, is, is really just, you know, what the world is throwing at us right now. And so we either get to kind of dig in and try to stay entrenched in how things were in the past or we can embrace the ambiguity and uh, open ourselves up to change and prepare for the future. So uh, I think uh, exploring your book's really gonna be a a fun uh, opportunity. So tell us about why you wrote this book. What inspired you to write The End of Jobs? Uh, Annoyance and frustration inspired me. (laughs) I will say this, you know, look, as the founder of Work Market, uh, I had the opportunity to go and speak at many conferences and on many panels. And I'd hear other, you know, experts and thought leaders talk about things. And I think that's, that's crazy. Why is he saying that? Why is she saying that? That has no chance of coming true. And it started to strike me as not only disingenuous, but harmful as companies would say, oh my gosh, everyone's moving to on-demand labor. We have to do it too. No, no, they're, they're not. That's not happening. As the founder of Work Market, I wanted it to happen, but it wasn't. And I said, you know what, we need to bring some context to conversations about the future of work. And to me, that context, and importantly, evidence has three bases. One is the history of work. We've been here before, Jonathan, right? Like we've seen how companies and workers have come together in the face of technology change, social change, and a host of other things. The second is data. Let's look at the data and the data trends, data patterns, and where data is and what it means. And the third is, let's talk about how companies actually engage workers. 
because there is this rather large misconception that labor resource planning meetings kind of go like this. CEO walks in and she says, all right, so we got to do some of our workers, just hire the cheapest ones and screw them all. All right, meeting adjourned. <laughs> Shockingly, that is not, that is not how those meetings go. So understanding the history, understanding the data, understanding how companies actually engage workers, that's what we lay out in the book. And I think that those things are fundamental in having any conversation about the future of work. Wonderful. I, I completely agree. Um, so tell us, you know, kind of summarize uh, the, the main premise of the book, the key takeaways of the book, um, tease it for us a little bit. Sure. Well, look, the big takeaway is that there will be no net job losses from robots and AI. History tells us that, data tells us that, how companies engage workers tells us that, but it doesn't mean that we're not in for a rough patch. It doesn't mean that we will not lose a huge number of jobs, upwards of 25 million in the United States from automation, robotics, AI. And the big challenge for society is how do we retrain those workers? And history here has very poor lessons for us. Well, very good lessons that give us very poor or unfortunate outcomes, which are that we have not done this well. We have never done this well. And so we, we've mindful. always we've always been resistant, right? At any yeah. stage, we talk about the various industrial revolutions. We're in the fourth industrial revolution now. Mm -hmm. To your point, can we learn from history and from past mistakes so we can embrace the shift and these changes uh, better? Or are we going to dig in our heels and go kicking and screaming <laughs> into the future? I am hopeful that we will be mindful and learn lessons from history, but uh, people do change poorly. Companies do it even worse and societies do change terribly. And so this change will come quicker. And in that case, I am not overly optimistic, but we have new technologies and new processes for adapting and for helping to retrain workers. And in that case, I am optimistic. Yeah. And, and for the same reasons, I'm, you know, I'm concerned, I have my concerns, but I do um, have optimism and I'm cautiously optimistic about um, moving forward into the future. And, and frankly, you know, I, I see, I mean, to your point, will there be disruption? Uh, will there be displacement uh, of jobs? Yes and yes, right? Um, but at the end of the day, will we have net job loss or net job gain? And I think these new technologies, when leveraged and embraced, uh, they will open up a whole world of new opportunities and new types of work experiences and new jobs. Um, of course. Right. And so that's where the, the reskilling and upskilling has to come so that we can have people that are trained, you know, for the jobs of, of yesterday that now they'll be prepared when their jobs get displaced for the jobs of the future. Very true. But let's, let's talk through an example if we could. And, and this has become my favorite example. I used to talk about the ATM and I talk about the ATM in the book. Uh, but let's talk about truck drivers. Now, Jonathan, if I were to ask you, that's right, you didn't realize I'm going to flip it on you right now. I'm going to ask you some questions. If I were to ask you, of the three, they're knowing that there are 3.3 million people employed as truck drivers in the United States. How many people do you think will be employed as truck drivers in the United States in 10 years? Yeah, with, with self-driving vehicles, um, there has to be a shift there. Uh, but I guess the question is, and I don't know, I don't know the answer to that, but the question is, will they be traditional truck drivers in the way they've been truck drivers in the past? Or will now they be, um, do we still need people to be involved with the transportation of goods? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You know what? Shocking nobody. Incredibly thoughtful answer to that question, as opposed to the normal, which is, oh, probably none. Or I don't know, maybe just like a million. And here's the answer that I think about. I think about the fact that there'll probably be about 3.5 million truck drivers in the United States in 10 years. And here's why. The idea that autonomous vehicles are coming is an idea that we've had for 10 years. The idea of getting them road ready, that last 10%, we've been 10% away for 10 years. We may never have autonomous vehicles. That's actually a reality. I think it's a very low probability, but it is a possibility. So in the next five years, Let's assume, oh my God, they cracked that code. I don't think it'll happen, but let's assume that that happens. When that code gets cracked and the vehicles are road ready, it doesn't mean the road itself is ready. 
It won't have the infrastructure, the censoring technologies, the recharging technologies, the regulatory environment necessary to have these trucks going all over the place. GATT may take another 10 years in and of itself, but let's say it only takes another five. It won't, it'll take much, much longer. Now we're 10 years out. And then what has to happen? Trucking companies have to go and replace their trucking fleets. It will cost upwards of $300 billion. I shouldn't say upwards, by the way, that's the low end estimate to replace the 2 million semi truck tractor trailers in the United States. The largest company in this space, Knight Swift, has an annual CapEx budget, not truck replacement budget, mind you, that's just a portion of their CapEx of $500 million. So let's say they spend $100 million to $200 million on truck replacement. It would take them, the largest company in the United States, 10 years to replace all their trucks. And then to your point, even when they're there, they're still not going to get rid of every single truck driver. And so when we look at the data, when we look at how companies actually engage workers or deploy capital, you see a picture that says for the next 20 years, we're not expecting that many job losses in trucking. The real story for truck drivers in the United States is that there's a shortage of them today. And the, one of the reasons there's a shortage, I would bet, is that people say, oh, truck drivers, their job's going. I don't want to go into that field. No, it's not going. This is a good, decent paying job for, a, 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 for any person that wants to go and attack this line of work. And we should be encouraging people to move into those types of jobs. It is just a one example that illustrates the complexity of the situation and the general misconception a lot of people have about how robots and AI are going to take jobs and how it's actually gonna play out. Yeah, so what I hear you saying is that the sky isn't falling, right? <laughs> when it comes to disruptive technologies, AI, machine learning, and, and how that's gonna kind of cause some, some shift and up, you know, there will be some upheaval and there will be challenges associated with embracing these new technologies. Um, but it's, and it will likely come faster than we've, we experienced in previous iterations of the industrial revolution. Um, but it's, it's not, the sky isn't falling and it's not, um, you know, th those are often are scare tactics, right? And yeah. whether, whether they're well-intentioned or whatever the reason, you know, we, we can be more thoughtful and more nuanced about how we approach the realities that, you know, th this shift will be facing, you know, putting on organizations. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data-driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. One of the many challenges we have as a society is the fact that you have to be sensational in order to get noticed and everybody wants to get noticed in the social media context. And that certainly applies to people making predictions about the future of work and thus sensationalist predictions get the most media pickup. And those generally are the most ridiculous, the most not based on evidence and the most incorrect. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, so what do you see as the biggest pros and cons, both sides of the coin in terms of organizations of the future embracing, you know, all these disruptive technologies we, we know about now that are, you know, we're trying to 
figure out and refine and prepare for uh, for the future of work, but but also technologies we don't even have a clue about right now, you know, that are going to pop up. <laughs> well, there will certainly be technologies we don't have a clue about and job functions and job roles that we don't have a clue about that history will tell us 10 years from now, 20 years from now, there will be millions of people employed in a job function that neither one of us who study this a lot and think about this a lot could even remotely think about. We won't, we couldn't guess it. And there'll be millions of people employed in it. If we had said 20 years ago to somebody, hey, they're gonna be millions of people employed as social media managers. People go, what, what the heck is that? Why would somebody need that? Huh. Well, we can argue as to not whether somebody actually needs that, <laughs> but uh, be that as it may, it is a job function that across the world, millions of people are employed in. Okay. So there is that. Look, in terms of how companies are going to act and react, they will do as they have done throughout history, which is they will be thoughtful. They will do a lot of analysis. They will dip their toe in the water. Once technologies are proven enough and they see the ROI and they will see what their customers like or dislike, they will see how their competitors are acting and responding. They will move more fulsomely. Look, the technologies existed to displace Every single retail checkout clerk, that technology has existed for 10 years. But I don't like that experience. I still like to go to a checkout person. And therefore, we haven't seen a huge amount of job loss there. So just because the technology exists doesn't mean that the jobs go away. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do, do you see other, like what other types of benefits do you see um, as we embrace technologies moving into the future? Well, the other clear benefit as technologies massively increase productivity is that they massively decrease the cost of production and the cost of goods. This is why historically, as we look at technological changes, the first three industrial revolutions, as you highlighted, because a lot of people call what we're in now the fourth industrial revolution, which I think is, is very accurate. One of the very clear patterns and very clear trends is a increase in the number of jobs, a decrease in the number of working hours and a increase in the standard of living those decreased working hours can provide. And we see that because we decrease the cost of production, we increase the amount of goods people are capable of consuming or the quality of goods and a host of other things. And therefore we have this tremendously wonderful standard of living that has increased. Very clear, very consistent trend. And so that is a huge benefit that will accrue to all of society. It doesn't mean that all members of society benefit from it, right? There are people that get left behind and we have this incredibly important responsibility to look after those people, to provide them with the support necessary to do the retraining, to get into the industries and the jobs that are growing. And we, if we don't do it, and again, we have done a poor job of this, as a society throughout history, as societies throughout history, we don't do this and we don't support these people to our peril. It will make this transition all the more difficult and it will be a difficult transition. Yeah, I, I think that's well said. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure what the answer is to that. Um, the, the, the issue with the haves and the haves not, the have nots and the, the, the systemic inequities that we see present in our many of our systems today, will we be able to close the gap? Will they be exacerbated by um, these continued shifts? Um, like you said, history doesn't always paint a great picture <laughs> on how we handled that in the past. I hope we can do a better job uh, this time. Uh, I, I truly hope that. I am um, with you. I am with you on that hope. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, so wonderful. I'm, I'm excited to have an opportunity to, to check out your book uh, in more detail uh, because everything you're saying resonates with me uh, so much. Um, and when, before we close, I'll ask you to share with listeners how they can get you know, in contact with you, how they can find out about your book, how they can get a copy of your book. Um, but before we go there, I did want to talk for just a few minutes about um, the Future of Work Prize. Can you tell us a little bit about that, why you decided to launch it? Sure. Well, the reason I decided to launch it was because writing a book is really hard. <laughs> and it took me seven years to write this thing. And as I was coming in uh, a year before I had finished, obviously I didn't know it was a year before I finished yet, 
I thought, you know what, I'm not, I'm not coming up with enough pages and I do not like to repeat. I'm not, I'm not, not a repeater. Don't like to repeat. So you had to say that three times. Um, and so I came up with the idea of asking a lot of the people that I interviewed for the book, a lot of people that I got the chance to know through work market to give me their thoughts on what the world of work looks like in 2040. I mean, it occurred to me, Jonathan, that I was so fortunate to be able to interview these people, to get to know these people. And these are the men and women that are actually shaping the future of work. They're the leaders of the, some of the largest staffing firms. They're the leaders of the largest unions, the heads of HR and executives of some of the largest companies. These are the people that are really transforming their organizations to deal with all the changes we're talking about. So what do they think? What do they think the world looks like in 2040? And I was able to convince enough of them to do it. They wrote these beautiful pieces that we included into the book, uh, 20 pieces. And I was thinking as I was coming up with this idea, you know what, I'm an advisor to the XPRIZE. I'm a huge fan of the XPRIZE. Why don't I create my own little XPRIZE? So I personally put up a, a $10 million prize, which is the, the XPRIZE amount. Uh, for whomever, which other of the authors are the most correct in their prediction. Now, that means we got to wait until 2040 to find out who is the most correct. So this will be the one area in my life I root for inflation. But it is, it is so fascinating, and I am so honored and so impressed with everything that uh, these people wrote. And it just it makes for just a much better book and a much better read than just here's Jeff Wald's thoughts based on history, based on data, based on how companies engage workers. That's one point of view, but here are 20 other points of view that are equally, if not better, informed. Uh, and it was a great, great part of the book, easily my favorite part of the book, mostly because I didn't have to write it. <laughs> well, good. Tapping into the expertise of others is an ingenious way to go about uh, writing a compelling book. So, so good job, that, you know, um, and, and like you said, while there's challenges in, in coordinating that, um, ultimately it, it, it enriches the read, it, it enriches the experience of the reader and, uh, and leveraging that expertise of, of all those other people um, that also are doing a lot of work in this area. So that's excellent. Um, so Jeff, as we wrap up today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about what you're up to, what you're doing on an ongoing basis, find your book, all, all of that kind of stuff. Can you, and then give us the last word on the topic. Sure. Well, I appreciate it. The one place in the world that I go by Jeffrey and not Jeff is on Twitter because I, I couldn't get at Jeff Wald. So at Jeffrey Wald on Twitter. LinkedIn, though, is the place that I, I post the most and, and interact with people the most. You can always reach out on LinkedIn. And the book, you know, as you mentioned, we were, number, we were fortunate to become an Amazon bestseller, hit number one in all of Amazon's HR categories. Amazon is still the best place to get the book, although as bookstores open, uh, I'm very excited to walk into my first bookstore and, uh, and see the book on the shelves. So I'm uh, looking forward to that. Uh, and then the last word on the topic is one of, of caution to be wary to your listeners of any time they hear predictions in the future of work. Be wary. I'm not saying that my approach is correct. I'm just saying that it gives a higher probability that predictions of the future of work that are not based on history, that are not based on data, that are not based on how companies engage workers, just be wary of those predictions and take them with a grain of salt. Yeah, because that's just looking into a crystal ball, right? Um, we have to have uh, we have to have reasons for uh, looking at trends and, and how they lead into predictions. Uh, so I, I think your approach is the right one. Um, as, as an academic, you know, who also does, you know, work in the consulting world and, and in this space, you know, I, I, I'm all for the data. I'm a data wonk. So I, I love that, uh, that caution. And, and I really appreciate the opportunity, Jeff, to talk with you today to learn more about your book and your approach. And I really encourage listeners to reach out, get connected on LinkedIn, check out the book, um, support Jeff and his work. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.
we are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.